Thank you so much, uh, Brother Will, for leading us in song this morning. Yeah, give him a round of applause. Thank the Lord for working through our brother. And I don't know about you guys, I'm going to miss uh, this family, uh, Brother Will and, and Ian, as they are going to be moving up to Moultrie. You guys uh, have any dates set yet, or y'all? Not yet. All right. It'll be a couple more months, probably. Okay. All right. Well, I guess I better not uh, uh, say too much about y'all leaving if it's going to be a little while. So. <laughs> but, uh, but we are going to miss you, brother, and uh, going to miss you, Ian, and the youth group and everything. Ian had said uh, that he was just going to, he was hoping that he'd be able to keep on coming to the youth group. And I said, well, if you're going to be living in Moultrie, it'll be kind of hard to, <laughs> but he said, well, I was thinking we'd just keep on coming. I said, no, y'all find yourself a good church home up there. But, um. Uh, but y'all have meant so much to this church family throughout the years, and we've been blessed to know you guys for the last uh, uh, few years, so um, so you'll be missed. Um, if, I invite you to turn with me, if you've got a copy of God's Word, to uh, Psalm chapter 24. Psalm chapter 24 is where we are at this morning. Psalm chapter 24. And uh, just a couple years ago... Not sure how many are aware of this uh, NASA mission, but there was a uh, mission by NASA to send uh, a uh, a device all the way from our planet to the uh, outer core of the sun. And uh, so they they shot this this satellite device. It was unmanned, but they, they shot it all the way out, and it took... Uh, I believe uh, about uh, 30 or so days in order to reach the sun. And, uh, and it was the fastest moving object that humanity has ever created, they said. 90, uh, I think it's 90 million miles away from us. And uh, somehow or another it reached its destination. But uh, doing that required uh, 60 years of preparation. And so as they had to get ready to, to shoot this thing uh, towards this enormous burning star they had to figure out how are we going to get it there in order to take all these measurements and uh, and still be able to retrieve that without it melting and so this was the closest anything had ever come to the sun and so for 60 years they did a lot of planning they, they did a lot of uh, preparation they they had to discover how something could get that close to a burning blazing star without melting and they discovered that combination of tungsten and titanium working together would not be melted in the face of this awesome majestic uh, mass of a star that was on fire and uh, so they they did that and uh, they were able to uh, read back and find out a lot of information about our Sun and the thing that we are discussing this morning is about how we as God's people we must be prepared to enter into the presence of of one who is much more powerful than a star. Uh, our sun is actually one of the smaller stars in, uh, in the galaxies around us, and yet that sun is so powerful that 90 million miles away, we can be sunburned in just a matter of an hour or so by standing outside without sunscreen on. So, But yet we're talking this morning about uh, what is required to stand in the presence of one who is much more powerful than the Son, and that is the Lord God Almighty, the King of Glory. Psalm chapter 24 was actually uh, a psalm that many scholars believe that was uh, recorded uh, to uh, be sung during the time when the uh, Ark of the Covenant would be brought back into Jerusalem. And uh, as this Ark was brought back into Jerusalem, there was an awareness that this Ark uh, of course, it did not contain God, but God uh, dwelt in a personal way within this ark, in a powerful way. And uh, he allowed his presence to be poured out on this ark. And yet, as they prepared to have this celebration, the Philistines had taken the ark, and it had been a long time in the uh, house of Dagon, uh, they, their false god. They believed it was all because their god gave them the victory. And yet, if you know the storyline of, uh, of the Ark of the Covenant, when they brought it into the house of their god, Dagon, uh, their god, uh, as they sat there in front of their god, so to speak, at its feet, 
they woke up the next morning and their God was bowing down to the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord God, Jehovah. And of course, uh, as that continued, they began having tumors and, and, uh, and, and rat infestations and all kind of crazy things that they knew there is something about this God that is more powerful than our gods. And so they wanted to get rid of it and they took it to various different places in the uh, Philistine uh, camp and no matter where they took it the same thing happened people would die of tumors and there would be rat infestations and so finally they decided we're just going to put the ark on this cart and send it back with these cows and these cows went on carrying the ark and it came to uh, to the land of Israel well uh, David was excited about the fact that the ark was now back with God's people the ark represented the presence of God with his people and so, as they prepared to celebrate this, uh, they put the ark on a cart, just as they had seen it brought there. They didn't think too much about how God wanted them to carry the ark. They just thought, we're just going to put the ark on this cart and we'll bring it into Jerusalem. Well, if you know the story, uh, the Bible tells us that uh, as the ark was moving on this cart, all of a sudden, uh, the oxen stumbled a little bit, and the ark began to fall off, and Uzzah reached out his hand to stop it, and the moment he touched the ark, God struck him dead. And David in that moment was reminded of something, that we must be very careful when we come to the presence of a holy God, that God is not something to be trifled with, that the king of glory is a holy king, and that they must do exactly what he wants. God is the one who decides how he will be worshipped. And so uh, the Bible tells us that, uh, that they went uh, back, looked at the scriptures, discovered that actually they had rebelled against God by not worshipping him the way that he wanted. The ark was not to be put on a cart. It was meant to be carried on the shoulder with poles that were to go through the ark so that you wouldn't touch it because we are so sinful that humanity touching the ark would actually bring the judgment of God. And so, all that to say, they finally were able to bring the ark. And this psalm is one that many believe was recorded as a reflection on this. So, if you're able, in honor of the reading of it, I invite you to stand with me as we read Psalm 24. It says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Say well. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you, Lord, just aware, just as Moses was when he approached your presence, and you told them, take off the shoes of your feet for the place you are standing is holy ground. We are aware that we are standing in holy ground today, that we are sinners, that we are opening your holy word. Lord, we don't want to tamper with it. We don't want to twist it. Lord, we don't want to have a casual worship service this morning. We want to enter into the very presence of God, aware of the fact that it is only through faith in your son, Jesus, that we are here. And God, that we would have that holy reverence that, uh, that David had of old. And Father God, that we would maintain this with our lives. Bless now the opening of your word, that you may be clearly exalted, and that your Son and his precious work may be made known more precious to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so uh, this, uh, this psalm is all about that. How are we going to enter into the presence of someone who is so holy? How are we going to prepare ourselves to be able to come into the presence of a holy God, uh, just as those... Now, scientists had to figure out how are we going to get this satellite structure all the way into the presence of this blazing sun without it melting. So how are we going to prepare to enter into the presence of God? 
And uh, the scripture tells us right here that there is a certain lifestyle that, that must be accompanying those who come by faith in this King of glory. And so with Father's Day here, I think it's good for us to take a look at, at really what a man of God and also a woman of God, uh, how they are to live in light of this amazing King. So we see here that we must be a people of holiness whose lives welcome this amazing King of glory. First off, we're going to take a look in our passage at our approach to him, the King of glory. And then secondly, we'll see in the uh, second half of the passage his approach to us and what that means. So first off, we see in verses 1 through 6, it's divided by that word Selah, and that is our approach to him. How do we approach the King of glory? Well, first off, it must be one of humility. We must have a, an approach to him that is humble. Just as Uzzah learned the hard way that you do not grab the very uh, ark that, re that represents the presence of God. So we don't just uh, flippantly walk into the very presence of God. That we must realize who we are coming before. And the first thing God says in this psalm, in verse 1, is basically, I own the ground that you walk on. I own the ground you walk on and I own you. He says, the earth is the Lord's. And the fullness thereof, the world, and listen to this, and those who dwell therein. So God wants us to know that in order to approach him, you've got to come humbly. The Bible does tell us that one day, one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess. And that is because he is a God who is to be worshipped. So this psalm begins with God and his rightful ownership of everything. He owns us by virtue of creating us. You know, if you build something... Uh, whether it be uh, you know, a, a Lego toy like our kids uh, build at the house, yeah. um, or whether it be you know, something else, maybe a painting that you paint, uh, then guess what? You own it. That's yours. It's yours by virtue of the fact that you made it. And so if somebody else were to take it from you, then you would say, that's rightfully mine. I have created that. I have built that. And yet, as we, as we think about creating something, only God can create. The Bible tells us He creates Ex nihilo, which is the word that means from nothing. You see, every single thing we have to work with is materials that God created for us to work with. No human creates. We may build things, we may make things, but God creates from nothing other things that exist. And so because of that, he owns every single thing that we have to work with. He owns us. Inventors may patent things to protect themselves from uh, others stealing their ideas, uh, but God owns all the copyrights and all the universe, doesn't he? He owns everything. There's nothing under the starry sky that isn't his. There's no black hole in deep space. There's no quasar out there that isn't his. It is all his, and it is all his by amazing creative decree. I love what Psalm 50 says, verse 12. If I were hungry, God says, I would not tell you, for the world in all its fullness are mine. We know that passage that says in Psalm 50, the cattle on a thousand hill. He owns them all. Psalm 60, listen to this. David describes God. God's as if, it's as if God's dividing up what he owns. And he says this. Uh, Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is my helmet. Judah is my scepter. Moab is my wash basin. Upon Edom I cast my shoe. Over Philistia I shout in triumph. It's like God is saying, hmm. All right, let's see what's mine and let's see what's yours. Let's divide this thing up. This is mine, this is mine, this is mine, this is mine. Oh, wait, it's all mine. <laughs> you own nothing, not even yourself, God says. Now, parents throughout the generations like to remind their children of this when they get into that entitled mindset. Hey, don't forget that I own that car and I own whatever money is in your account, that I own the bed that you sleep on, that I own the food that you eat, that I own the house that you live under this roof. Why do they say this to their children? It's because they know that their children in that moment are forgetting something very important, that is that they ought to be grateful and that they ought to be humble. And they ought to be appreciative of their mom and dad. And so the psalmist wants to say, David says, hey, before we get started, let's do this. Let's make sure we realize who it is we're approaching. We're approaching the God who owns us. William Plummer says this, If there was in the world one man or one creature or one atom over which God was not sovereign, 
It would be impossible to foretell the evil and confusion that might follow. And I love that as we think about this COVID-19 thing. If it were possible for God not to be in control of COVID-19, or not to be in control of what's happening in our country right now, if it were possible, he says, the evil that that would mean. That everything is just falling apart and that God has no control over. No, God says, hey, first off, come humbly. Come humbly. He owns us not just because he has created us. He owns us because he's redeemed us. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, you are not your own. For you were bought with a price. The precious blood of the Lord Jesus. So as we come, we come humbly before this King of glory. Also, we have to come in holiness. The passage says, who stands in His presence? Who can come before Him? Who can ascend this hill of the Lord and stand in His holy presence? And really the answer is no one. No human being can be as Uzzah can touch the ark and not be struck dead. No human being can walk into the presence, the very throne room of God, in their own righteousness, in their own performance, and not be condemned. Uh, I've talked about this with our kids before. Um, you know, when you, if you were to go and visit the President of the United States, uh, you wouldn't walk right up into the Oval Office, sit on his chair, kick your feet up, take your shoes off, maybe clip your nails on his desk, and pick up his phone and dial in some pizza. And you wouldn't do all that, would you? And yet, when we approach God, we're approaching one who is over the President of the United States, for sure. We are approaching one who is higher than any authority. He is actually the King of kings and the Lord of all lords. The one who raises kingdoms and lowers kingdoms. The one who has put all authorities in their places. The one to whom all authorities are going to one day bow and give reverence. And so approaching this God calls for holiness. Holiness. So... We must be men and women of holiness as we come into the presence of this God. Let's go back to Psalm 15, if you will turn there with me, and let's just look at that because it is very closely connected. He says in Psalm 15, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your holy tent in your tent, excuse me? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right, and speaks truth in his heart. He who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor nor takes up a reproach against his friend in whose eyes a vile person is despised but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. So Psalm 24 is actually... Psalm 15 in a shorter version. And, and I mean, Psalm 24, verse 4 is, is really Psalm 15 in a shorter version. As a matter of fact, William Plummer says this, Perhaps no verse of Holy Scripture in so few words, right here in verse 4 of our Psalm, Psalm 24, perhaps no verse of Holy Scripture in so few words more clearly delineates the character of a real saint. Such a man shall be saved. Wow, what a blessing we have here, the kind of individual that God blesses right here. It is one who is walking in holiness. Hebrews 12, 14 tells us, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness, listen to this, without which no one will see the Lord. And so let's take a look at this holiness. He says, clean hands and a pure heart. If we stopped right there, then we could tell that it was both uh, that is describing both external holiness, clean hands, our actions, and internal holiness, clean hearts, pure hearts, which is our motives. So we may be able to keep certain laws externally, but the scripture says if you want to come in the presence of the most holy king of glory, then you have to be pure not only on the outside, in your actions, but on the inside. On the inside, James 2.10 tells us, if you keep the whole law externally, and he says, and yet stumble at one point, you're guilty of breaking all of them. Wow, this is powerful. Jesus said 
that if you could keep all of those external laws, just like the Pharisees, boy, they tried as hard as they could to keep all those external laws. He says, if you did all of that, it still wouldn't be good enough. You still wouldn't be the one Psalm, 4 is talk, Psalm uh, 24 4 is talking about here. Listen to what Jesus says. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. All right. So happy Father's Day. We are all condemned. How is that good news for us on Father's Day? Well, it's good news for us because God never intended his law to, to be for us the means by which we could approach him in our perfect holy life. You see, if God gave us a law and said, here's how you can approach me, be this sort of a person, and he expected us to actually be able to carry that out, then that would mean we would not need Jesus. Jesus would never have needed to die. Paul actually says this in Galatians chapter 3. He says, if God had made a law that could save you by means of your performance, and you could be okay coming into the presence of a holy God because you're trying as hard as you can to be you know, clean hands and a pure heart, and you're that kind of a man. Uh, if a law was possible to save you that way, Galatians 3 says, then Christ would have not needed to die. There would have been no purpose in Jesus coming if we could save ourselves. So, the scripture tells us that we're not capable of doing this. So when Jesus comes on the scene, many think that he makes the law a little bit easier for us to follow and says, oh, just love others and you'll be good. That's not what Jesus said, actually, is it? Jesus, when he came on the scene, he stood on the mount just as Moses stood on the mount. He gave the law just as Moses gave the law. And yet he said this. You know what? He said, murder, when it says you shall not murder, it doesn't mean just don't physically kill someone. He says, if you even call your brother fool, then you're a murderer. Jesus said, when it said do not commit adultery, it didn't mean don't go out and actually commit the physical act of adultery with, with uh, someone else's spouse. It meant that even if you have lust in your heart towards another person, then you've committed adultery already. You see what Jesus is doing here? He's trying to say, you want to live by Psalm 24? All right, here, let me press it home. Be absolutely, wholeheartedly pure in your thoughts and, and never, ever, ever sin. Wait, wait. Are you trying to tell me that Psalm 24 is here for us to tell us that we could never be perfect? Then why is it telling us the kind of character to enter into the presence of God? It's because the scriptures have one clear message from Genesis to Revelation, and it is that God is a holy God, and that God demands perfect holiness. And if we want to approach a holy God, we must come not with our sins and flaws, but we must come through the perfect holiness of of God. How do we do that? The scripture is very clear. We cannot. God's standards are so high that no human being could ever attain them. And yet there is one human being who did attain those. And that is the one through whom we come. We come by means of one who had clean hands and a pure heart. One who was absolutely on the outside and on the inside, totally sinless and perfect. Amen. We come before God through His Son, Jesus, through faith in His Son, Jesus, and we are accepted. Because on our own, we cannot. Just to drive the nail into the coffin a little more of our human effort, the same Bible which says, here's the standard, be holy, externally and internally, is the same Bible that says this, we all fall hopelessly short. Isaiah 64, 6 says, that even if we tried at our best efforts at righteousness, they are nothing more than a stinking rag to a holy God. Job 25, 6 says that we are as impure as maggots and worms to him. Jeremiah 17, 9 says that our hearts, the very core of who we are as humans, cannot be trusted, and they are desperately sick. Wow. Paul says that, oh, actually we're already dead in our sins, that we're six feet under the ground. There's nothing we can do anyway. Because everything we do is from a heart that is distanced from God, that doesn't know God. So the scripture is wanting to make it impossibly hard for you to be a good person. Because what good means is perfect. And there's none who is that. Why is the Bible doing this? Here's the standard, everybody. Be perfect. No oh, wait, you can't. Matter of fact, your best efforts stink to high heavens. 
Is God just waving some impossible demand in front of us and taunting us by saying, you know what, you'll never actually achieve this? Is there any hope for us to be truly holy, to come into his presence? Well, this is the rock-bottom purpose of the entire Bible. God demands a righteousness that we cannot attain. Why? To answer that question is to answer what the Bible is all about. God demands a righteousness that we cannot attain. And why is that? It is so that we will fix our eyes to the heavens and long for the Redeemer who will perform His perfect righteousness on our behalf and will take all of the sins that we've committed and plunge them underneath the depths of the sea. How is God going to do that? Through the Lord Jesus Christ. So Psalm 24 is a messianic psalm. I like what Phil Johnson has said about it. Psalm 22 is about the cross. Psalm 23 is about the good shepherd. We know that's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 24 is about the king of glory. We know that's none other than the Messiah himself. David was not simply telling us how we could clean ourselves up and prepare to enter into uh, this presence of a God. He was trying to tell us that there is no way unless the king of glory himself comes down. God says, here is the standard perfect holiness. You want to approach me, then you must be absolutely perfect. And if you, like Uzzah, even dare to stand in my presence on your own, then you'll die, just like him. But then he says, but here's my son, Jesus. He kept my law for you. He died as your substitute. He rose for your justification. Hope in him. And God should have killed us like he killed us for even daring to try to live in, in his presence. And yet what God did was he said, I'll kill my only beloved son in your place. Isaiah 53, 18, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. Who? The servant of the Lord, the Messiah, the one who would be crucified. This was all God's perfect plan. Acts chapter 2 says this was God's predetermined will that by means of his son going to the cross, sinners would be redeemed. So who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Who can stand in his holy place? Only those who come by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I like what the author of Hebrews says. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. You say, wait, 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 we can't draw near. There's no way I could draw. God would kill me if I drew. No, no. You draw near by the blood of Jesus. He says, and now that you are a child of God, trusting in the blood of Jesus, then you draw near with confidence that you may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. So wait a second, Austin. Are you telling us that, uh, that we have to pursue holiness or that we don't have to pursue holiness anymore because Jesus is our holiness, he is our righteousness, and we don't really have to actually try to be holy. Like it says, clean hands and a pure heart, you know that Jesus did that, we're good to go. We don't actually have to be holy anymore. Not at all. All who trust in Christ and who are born again by the Spirit, they do pursue holiness. And they have the power, as David had the power, even though the Spirit of God hadn't been poured out in the same way, David was trusting in the one who was to come. He was trusting in the Messiah. Didn't know who that was going to be. He asked, who is the king of glory? Who's the king of glory? I don't know who the king of glory is. We know his name is Jesus, David. And yet David says, I'm trusting. I'm coming by means of faith in God's promise of the Messiah. And he is able to approach. Those who are truly born again do not live in sin. They pursue righteousness. You see what God does? He comes on the inside and he changes our hearts. And then when he changes us internally, then he also changes us externally. We become living vessels of worship and praise to him. So we must come as men and women of God, humble and holy, and uh, we can come in hope. We can come in hope. The verse 5, our next point is not going to be as long as this, by the way, but verse 5 says he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. There is no sweeter verse right here in this psalm than verse 5. He or she who comes by means of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is perfectly righteous, will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Underline that words; those words, will receive. Will receive. We don't present these 
efforts of righteousness to God one day and say, here's my righteous life, God. I've lived it for you. No, he says, you must receive righteousness. In other words, you want to come with your righteousness, then it won't be good enough. It'll be filthy rags and you'll be struck dead. If you come receiving my righteousness, I'm the God of salvation. I will give you that righteousness. We have a God who gives righteousness to those who are willing to receive it. Maybe you're here this morning and you have been trying to perform your own righteousness and trying to be a better person and trying to go to church a little more and trying to uh, maybe help out in this way or that way and, and, and trying to be better. Uh, he says, no, 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 you, you're, you're trying to present a righteousness instead of receiving God's righteousness. Romans chapter 10 said that was the entire reason why the Israel, uh, why Israel rejected Jesus. It was because they tried to work up and merit their own righteousness instead of trusting in his righteousness. So the psalm goes on to tell us, this is the generation of those who seek him. This is the true Jacob is the, uh, is the actual, is the real meaning there. He says the true God, the, seek the face of the God. This is the true people of God. The true people of God are those who walk in this holy lifestyle. Those who do not lift up their soul to literally what is vanities, who don't swear deceitfully. These are people who have been changed as they have been beholding his glory. So this is all our approach to him. In just a couple minutes, we'll close with his approach to us. So we know that when we come before this king, we must come as needy beggars. We must acknowledge our spiritual bankruptcy. And we must come receiving a righteousness that we don't have. Well, what should be our response when the king comes to us, when he approaches us? The psalmist tells us there, first off, that God's that his approach to us demands our preparation. He says, lift up your heads, O gates. We have to be prepared. If the president were to come to town, they've got to get the roads ready, right? They've got to shut down St. Augustine or however, whichever way he's going to come. They're going to block it off and they're going to allow no cars to go. They're going to put snipers on all the roofs and make sure everybody's safe. And they're going to level anything that is unlevel. If there is one pothill on St. Augustine, it will be filled before the president of the United States shows up, right? There will be nothing going on and the motorcade will arrive with everything shut down. And so it is when Jesus shows up on the scene. Jesus showed up on the scene and John the Baptist, what did he say? Prepare the way of the Lord. How did he prepare? He said, repent. Repent for the King of Heaven is coming. Turn your hearts to Him. That's why this psalm, when it talks about as the uh, Ark of the Covenant is entering in, it's almost going into the gates of Jerusalem and the gates are about to be open. There's these two choruses that, that sing, uh, uh, the word is antiphonally, they sing back and forth to one another. One chorus stands there with the ark and says, um, Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. The other chorus is standing there at the entrance of the gate, and they're looking back, and they say, Who is this King of glory? And then both choruses together sing, The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. And then it goes on again, and they they repeat verses 9 and 10. And so this is a beautiful picture. And actually, this is a messianic psalm. And this points to when Jesus was resurrected and ascended uh, to heaven. The angels were there. And uh, one could picture the angels standing there at the gates and, uh, and demanding entrance of the king of glory. And they say, who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of of glory and Jesus is ushered in and the Bible says that he sat down there on the throne as one who sits in accomplished victory. He had purchased our salvation and now he sits reigning and ruling from his heavenly throne. This demands our preparation to know that this king who is now seated in heaven is going to return, isn't he? And what are we going to do when that king comes? We got to be prepared. He says, "Lift up your heads, O gates, say, hey, we have to be prepared." You know, uh, we've got a, uh, a thief in our neighborhood, uh, somebody who's around our neighborhood, and uh, every few days we hear from somebody right down from us who's gotten their car broken into, somebody stealing a bunch of stuff. And 
Well, the thing about a thief is, uh, you know, how do you prepare for a thief? Jesus said when he comes, he's going to come like a thief in the night. How do you prepare for a thief? Well, you have to actually, the, the thief's going to show up, you know, under cover of darkness, and, uh, you know, he's going to randomly uh, break into cars and random nights. And uh, so what, he's, what you have to do is you have to actually stay awake all night and be watchful and be ready. Jesus said, he's coming like a thief. And he said, spiritually, don't let your guard down. Be watchful. Be men and women of God who are ready for his return. He says, be like those, those ten wise virgins, not the ten foolish virgins that Jesus gave the parable about, where he said, you know, the, the ten wise ones, they had their oil ready, they had their lamps, their, the, uh, the wicks on their lamps were ready, and they were, they were ready to light them at any moment so that when he showed up, they were ready. And the ten foolish virgins they said, hey, can we borrow some of the oil? We didn't bring enough oil. And he says, no. They weren't allowed. He came at a time when they weren't expecting it. We have to be prepared for his return. He's going to come at any moment. We are closer right now than we ever have been to the king of glory. Bursting from the eastern sky with a trumpet of the archangel Michael. We are closer right now than any other civilization has ever been. Are you prepared? Are you prepared? And of course, how do I get prepared? You come through Jesus. Trust in what he did for you. And you walk in a lifestyle of holiness, bearing the fruit of true repentance. This also calls for our submission. He's a king, all right. He's a king of glory. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this scene played out before, but I've been in a fast food restaurant before. And, you know, somebody's holding up the line at the front and, and you're wondering what's going on, why is it taking so long, and then you peer past everybody's heads and you see a woman standing there looking at her little three-year-old boy and saying, little Johnny, what do you want? What do you want? Just order something from this menu. And there's all these hundreds of options available to little Johnny. He has no idea. His mind is just blown. And, uh, and I bring that up uh, because... You know, you just want to say, order for him. The kid's only three. You know, the kid's not able to order. He doesn't know what he wants. And so uh, this one uh, who is going to come uh, is calling for our submission. We can't stand there and do what we want. We can't try to be like little Johnny, trying to, uh, uh, or basically just trying to wait until we're ready and trying to figure out what we want. He's a king, and if there's one thing about kings, it's that kings don't ask your opinion on things, do they? Kings rule. Kings reign. That's what it means to be a king. Kings don't ask opinions. They give demands. And they execute those who don't obey their commands. Now, thankfully, we have a king who is not an evil tyrant. He laid down his life for his enemies. Uh, however, he is still the king of kings. So we must submit our lives to his lead and let him call the shots. So here's a question for each of us this morning. Who calls the shots in your life? Who makes the brunt of your daily decisions? Is it you or God? Who thinks predominantly the thoughts that go in your mind? Is it, are you submitting your thoughts, taking every thought captive, making it obedient to Christ? Or, is, or are you running around in your brain saying, I'm doing this, I'm thinking that, I'm thinking this. We must submit. And also, he's the king of glory. All this will resound to his glorification. His glorification. John the Baptist says, He must increase. I must decrease. So what's your heart attitude when you draw near to God? One of entitlement or one of humble and reverent worship? Do you come in faith believing that God will hear and respond? Or do you come doubting? Have you been living for His Son's soon return? Or have you been playing around with the fleeting treasures and pleasures of sin? Would Christ have found you busy serving him this week if he arrived unexpectedly? And would others who see you most say that he is king of your life? Or that you are king of your life? These are questions for each of us to consider. And to remember, the only reason we as sinners can approach this God, through prayer, the study of His Word, and corporate worship when we gather together, the only reason is because He owns it all, and He has purchased our redemption through His Son's precious blood. And we come not hoping in our own righteousness, but hoping in His. 
and that and that alone is the way that we can approach such an amazing king of glory. So let's uh, close out with a word of prayer. Father, thank you, God, so much for not only demanding perfection, but then providing what you demand. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the righteousness that he lived for us. God, help us as uh, sinners to acknowledge that we are not who we need to be and to continue to come by repentance and faith in Jesus. Lord, help us all to be trusting in the blood of Jesus alone. And Lord, help us to draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and grace in time of need. We pray this all in Christ's name.